Welcome to the Mentor Studio, where today's thought leaders and leading entrepreneurs inspire and bring real world ideas that help you take your career to levels you've only dreamed of. Now, buckle in. Here's your host, Michael Silvers. Welcome, everyone. I am truly excited right now. I get to sit down next to Sharon Lecter, her husband, Michael Lecter. Sharon, you know, I mean, Think and Grow Rich for Women, co-author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I can't even, my memory's not all, all that great, so I can't remember all the 14, 15, 20 books that, that you've co-authored. Michael teaches entrepreneurship, focus on, on IP. Thank you guys for being here. Really grateful. Delighted. So you have a huge focus on financial literacy. And as someone who did not grow up with a lot of financial literacy, and as a dad of an eight-year-old who wants to be able to teach it, I want to know, how did you first become interested in even this idea of financial literacy? Well, I grew up in a very um, entrepreneurial home. So I grew up understanding the importance of buying, building, creating assets. Um, traditional education teaches us to be employees, teaches us to rely on someone else for our money. And I did not realize until I was older that I learned something that most people did not learn. And then when I started seeing businesses fail, people not understanding the essence of building a business appropriately and other people having trouble with their personal finances, spending more than they earned, I realized I had a, a gift of knowledge that people needed to have. And then it was our own son, our oldest son, going to college and getting into credit card debt in 1992 is when I really dedicated the rest of my career to financial literacy and financial education. So what, that's really interesting. So what information did he not get that you had? Well, we taught, I taught him all the things that I learned. He, he just didn't but, listen. But he got, he got to college and he was greeted with his tables, free pizza, free money, free t-shirt, free money. So he had credit cards that we didn't even know he had. He saw us using the credit cards. He didn't see us paying the bills. Mm. Yeah. The just charge it mom mentality took over. Yeah. Yeah. You no. Know, so, so now I, I got to make it a little personal because I noticed that's what ha what's happening with me. He sees us, we just use a credit card and he mm -hmm. thinks that's the money. And, and my son, he does, doesn't see the other side. So how do we actually teach that other side as it's happening? What, what can I do better as a parent that, that didn't have happen. him have him sit there while you're paying the bills. God, that <laughs> and then you know today you can for teenagers I recommend getting money backed credit cards so that in essence you they have a credit card that's got three hundred dollars on it and they learn that when the money runs out they can't use it anymore and, they, oh. and they, they learn how to budget their money. I love that you know and so here's what's amazing to me like some of these ideas are just so simple like. Watch, watch, have them watch you pay the bills. I've never done that, right? It, it's so simple, but but we're not taught it. We don't think it. Well, this time of year, right before holidays, one of the biggest things I talk about is, yeah, you know, it's really the experience that's important as a gift, not the expense. And so many times you'll you'll buy your kids stuff that they want, toys, right? And it's on your credit card. And then they get excited on Christmas Day, play for it for two days, and then it gets in the corner <laughs> gathering dust. And you get the bill mid-January and they're not even playing with it anymore. Yeah. And it's a real lesson and it's something that you can share with them as far as what, rather than that, take them to the zoo, do something with them that they will remember. Hmm. I want to know the story of the two of you, because you're, you're both focused on this entrepreneurial space. And often then, you know, you say we're trained to be employees. Often, you know, what I witness is, you know, one partner is, is the entrepreneur and the other one is, is the employee, but you guys both really focus on that entrepreneurial space. And I want to know, was that a part of the beginning where you were attracted because of that? Or how did this evolve? I don't know that we really knew that I was attracted to the blue eyes. Ah, I, I, I hear that. <laughs> Well, you, he was an attorney, practicing an attorney when we met. So he was there helping other people create their entrepreneurial dreams. And I think it's something that um, we both 
have different spheres of expertise. And so they really overlap well. And we can really, when we're mentoring people, we mentor them from every aspect, from the legal side, the creation side, the intellectual property side, we from the marketing, accounting, and finance. So it really, we, we love working. And the together. communication side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got a deal. I get one word for every 37 of hers. But <laughs> that sounds the, fair. <laughs> it works. <laughs> she, she communicates better than I do. Right. I Gift of gab there. Yeah. Is. I don't know. Well, <laughs> she is the, the communicator. No, but it was about the relationship and how this, this really you know, formed, it's how, a, it stay, it, how it stays so powerful. It really is teamwork, you know, recognizing areas of strength yeah. you know, and playing to the strength. It isn't all smooth sailing because I'm the one that's the entrepreneur, the innovator. I want to, you know, I want to do things fast. I want to get things done. And he wants to make sure everything's it's covered. It's got to be right. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a little. You know, you, you, need, to, you need to have a, the right type of foundation for any sort of a venture. And a, one piece of that is a good legal foundation. Mm. You got to have the right entities. You got to have the right agreements. And I mean, otherwise, you can get yourself in all sorts of trouble. I mean, we, we were talking about some of the web-based agreements that uh, do everything but take your first word to sign. I mean, it's, uh, they get, they're really egregious. In fact, there was, there was an outfit called Mother Jones Sons software. Now, this was back decades ago, but they were the first ones to recognize the, the issues with some of these click wrap. Mm -hmm. Back then, it was box top or shrink wrap licenses. And they, they literally had an agreement that had people promising their first one. It was a joke, but people were signing that thing or were accepting it without any sort of pushback. And it just goes to show how people are ignoring basic foundational elements like the terms of contracts. Yeah. So how is how as business owners can we better protect ourselves or just as humans? Well, see, I mean, it's human. You got to read the contracts. Make sure you know what you're getting into. You also want to make sure you own what you pay for. One of the biggest mm -hmm. things that we talk about to people about is in today's world where we have all these outside sources and independent contractors that even taking your picture or doing something in marketing or building a website, if you don't have a work for hire agreement with them, you don't own what you pay for. Yeah, this is black letter law. If someone who's not a W-2 employee operating within the, the scope of their employment creates something for you, the, the, a work of authorship, video, uh, photographs, software, they own it, not you. Yeah. It's a huge issue. And most people would, when you want to go sell your company, the buyer's going to come in and they're going to want to see that you own everything that you purport to. And a lot of times you don't because you haven't taken the time to do the necessary legal act. You've been in this personal development world since long before I knew there was a personal development world. What have you seen change? E either, how has your philosophy changed from when you started you know, when was Rich Dad Poor Dad? That was 26 years, 26 years ago. So how, how, how has your philosophy changed? Or, or maybe it's, it's the same, but well, what have you seen change over the years? And how have well, you changed? Certainly it's more accessible now with the inter internet because when we first did Rich Dad Poor Dad, you had to go to a bookstore to buy the book. Amazon wasn't here, the internet wasn't here. Yeah, the nature we, of marketing and dis distribution is yeah, totally different now. Right, and we don't, you didn't have the ability to do online courses. So that <laughs> has been the drama a really dramatic change. But I also think from a standpoint as a speaker and the people that were are my genre, some of them aren't with us anymore. But when we first started our careers, we had to be perfect. We had, you know, we were the teachers. So we, you, vulnerability was a no-go for people in a position of teaching and training. And I think the world has changed now in the fact that you have to be authentic. You have to show vulnerability and accessibility. And I think that's all a good, that change is, is good. Who were some of your mentors early on? Well, certainly my father. 
he he really educated me in the idea that if I wanted to do something, I could do anything I wanted to. I just had to put my mind to it. And um, so he, he still is with me all the time because I know that he's watching from up there. But I think also you, know, you can have mentors that aren't here anymore because of the body of work that they left. So Napoleon Hill, of course, Dale Carnegie, the, you know, the really greats that had incredible wisdom as his knowledge today as it was when they wrote it. And I, I want, I have, an, I have a thought to that, but I want to hear, what about you? Who were some of the mentors that were important in your life? And most of my mentors were lawyers that, you know, that I worked with. You know, the, uh, I can't say I was all that well read in personal development. Yeah, I draw. I mean, we taught each other a lot of stuff. Person, yeah. <laughs> What is it about Napoleon Hill's work that makes it as relevant now as it was then? Well, I think it was a man before his time, and which is why he had such difficulties at time. He was a forward thinker. He had always these predictions. I mean, 120 years ago, he predicted that we'd pay for gas at the pump, which was ludicrous at the time. Right. And so there are lots he had. There's a, like 100 predictions he had and almost all of them came true. And I think he just he, he was a man of vision, didn't always apply it for himself. But what he wrote was is timeless and is as valid today as it was when he originally released Thinking Grow Rich in 1937. So that's really interesting that, that you say that, you know, about having this, this wisdom, these visions that he didn't apply to himself. And I, I see that in a lot of people. I, they, they have these amazing stories, but then it doesn't reflect back onto them and what they're doing. Why do you think that is? What, what do you see? Well, that's why he wrote the manuscript out when the devil, because he says, here I have created, thinking or rich, this th thesis, this term paper for success. And people will read it, but not do it for themselves. And, and that's because they are held back with fear, uh, lack of self-confidence, but primarily fear. And fear paralyzes you. And so he sat down and wrote out Winning the Devil, and I was locked away for 73 years. But I had the honor to bring it out. And it talks about how you can turn that fear into fuel, into energy to succeed. But that you have to be aware of where it came from. And it could have been from your early childhood. It could have been from your education. It could be from your parents, all those things. And when you can identify where the fear came from, you can start peeling it away, hmm. learning from your adversities, learning from your past, controlling your environment, controlling how you spend your time. And so that those, those things that were outlined and out when the devil has changed, made the world a whole different place for people reading that. You've shared about your son and left us much too early. How do how do those things change you? Well, well, you're <laughs> you never get over it. You're not supposed to outlive your children. Um, it when this it will be ten years tomorrow. Ten years tomorrow. Um, wow. Wednesday morning. I guess it was late. The Tuesday, the thirteenth, early the fourteenth. We got the phone call, and we were here in Vegas at the time. So this is. Kind of like us coming back to just remember them, and it was ten years, and you don't you don't ever get over it. And I tell I share people that it, it threw me into what I call a world of neutral, living you know in in a state of numbness for a long time. And I thought about retiring. I got a lot of pushback from family and friends, and I think I even heard him in my ear saying, "Get over it, Mom. There's more for you to do." Mm. And I think that that's the message I share with people today. We all have things that stop us in our tracks, and it could be a death, like in my situation, or an illness, a divorce, a financial setback, a bankruptcy. But you've made it. You're still here, sort of, for a reason. And if you can share how you survived, you can help other people going through the same thing. Well, it really tests your relationship, and you you've got to be ready to give each other space, wow. so that you can deal with it your own way, and not expect one person to do what the other one. Yeah, the vast majority of marriages don't survive. Yeah. So he and I had, we grieved very differently and we had to respect each other. And you shared what those differences were? Well, she wanted to be with her friends and I wanted to be alone. When you got the message that you had more to do, 
what tools did you use to move yourself obviously not over not passive but move yourself into being able to to rededicate yourself to giving more like how, how did you how did you make that shift well there was a, a point in time when i was speaking over in europe in front of 1500 people and i had done my keynote and then they were coming to ask me some q a sessions and they were supposed to ask me what's the worst thing that's ever happened to me in business and so I'm in front of 1,500 people, and they ask me, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? And there's only one answer to that. Yeah. And so that was the, that was the first time I explained to an audience that I had lost my son. And when I got off stage, there were over 200 people waiting in line to talk to me. And I realized that you know, being vulnerable and sharing that kind of thing can impact people in a positive way. Yeah. yeah I'm still a caveman. I'm not comfortable really talking about that sort of thing so the question that comes in i don't know if it's appropriate when you don't have to answer but what what stops you just my nature your nature yeah I, I grew up not expressing emotion yeah and it's still you know that's something that's very difficult to change I mean, one of the things, so so this podcast, it's a combination of the mentor studio and the self-love revolution, right? And one of the things in the self-love revolution is is teaching people how you know their worthiness, which you teach, how to connect to emotions and things like that. And that's why th this part of it, you know, especially given your background and history, you know, one of the missions of it is, is that no one ever no one ever takes their life again. That that if you look at my mission statement, and that. It's a couple other things there too, but yeah. that's certainly one of them. You again, you've been in this personal development world for, for for so long. How do we begin to teach people really their own self worth yeah. so that they can show up? Well, I think I'm going to take you back to the personal success equation that I write about in the book Three Feet from Gold, the first book that I with, did with the Napoleon Hill Foundation. It's around understanding we start with our passion and talents, and most of us stop there because we think we have to do everything on our own. Mm -hmm. And then the true success comes with the times A power of association, surrounding yourself with the right people, the right support network. And then times a taking action and then plus f having faith in yourself and that's where that f in most cases is fear because people don't have that confidence and when i we work with people we always go through this formally because you can all find out where the missing link is and it really for people that don't have self-confidence they don't have the right people around you because when you have the right people around you they won't let you stay down mm. they pull you back up so really making sure that not to try and travel the world alone, because what happens is when we are sad and depressed, we go insular. We put blinders on, we look down, we want to turn off the lights. And that just makes it worse because you spiral. And so allowing yourself to have people around you to keep the lights on, to keep the communication going, really helps you through the process. Who, who are some of those people in your life? Oh, I have a group of women that we've been in the Women Press Organization together for over 20 years. And so the day they found out that we, we got the call that we'd lost our son, I literally had someone with me every single day for, for weeks. Do you do you have a group yourself as well? Do you have that? Well, I've got friends. I'm, it's It's not a group like hers. When you think about what success means, how do you define it for you? Well, I have a very definite answer for that because obviously I'm all about money. I teach people about financial education, but true success is not the money in your bank account. It's how you feel about yourself when you look in the mirror. Hmm. Agreed. So what, when you look in the mirror, what do you think? Faithful servant. Faithful servant. So beautiful. What do you, you look in the mirror? What do you think? <laughs> you don't want to know. I do. I do. You don't have to share, but I do want to know. I don't force people to answer anything. He sees a cowboy that he wishes was 30 years younger. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> All our grades are earned, right? And what about self love? What do those words mean to you? Well, I think is self-love is something that most people do. particularly when you're dry, a type a driven individual you tend to drive to your own detriment because you don't take the time to recharge and energize so many people make a lot of money billionaire, billionaires millionaires and then they get to the point where their health is so compromised they can't enjoy it do them any good do you have uh, a daily routine something that 
keeps you grounded on a daily basis so that you can have the energy and continue to teach this? Like, what, what do you do? You wake up, what, what happens? Well, unlike most people, I actually do check my email first thing in the morning because it helps tell me if I have any crisis during the day that helps me focus the rest of my day. And I do a lot of reading and, um, you know, we have been in, he does a regular workout routine, which we were doing together for a while, but I've been a little remiss. So I would like to say that I work out every day, but there's a desire, not an actuality today. <laughs> Are you going to get her back? I'm going to get her back. Yeah. I travel That's so the goal. much. I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to, I, I don't believe in making excuses, but it's something that uh, we need to focus no, on. The, the traveling and is, has gotten in the way of getting the routine going again. How do you mean, how do you maintain the energy then when you, when you travel? It's just a gift from God, I think. Oh, wow. You just make yourself open to what am I supposed to do today? And the energy shows up. For someone who is, going through some sort of difficult time but they know that there's more for them to do to show up in the world but they don't know how to turn it around what's one thing you would you would say start here don't stay alone find somebody who has has something experienced something similar that can help you see that there's there's more you know become that light at the end of the tunnel don't wait for someone else to bring you the light just stand in your own power and become your own beacon of light and know that you don't have to do it alone that's her answer what's yours <laughs> introspection introspection how, you've how, got to come you've got to come to grips and how do you do it? Do you have a meditation practice or sitting with yourself or what is, what is it really? Well, it's a combination of meditation and distraction. And our ranch is a perfect place for people to have that happen because when you go there, it's so beautiful. It's in the middle of the Tonto National Forest and you realize that you're just a speck. Your, your problems are tiny compared to the beauty of, the God, of God's world. So it really is, it does help you reflect. And all the work that you've done and all the books that, that both of you have written, so many, um, what are you most proud of? Well, that's like asking who your favorite child is. Is it? Yeah. But, I was going to say I was most proud of my kids, but yeah. that works. <laughs> But I think the my grandkids, yeah, the different books are perfect for different people. So like yeah. the younger generation outweighing the devil by far. Women in business think of a rich for women. People are going through a transition and they're trying to find that next step where they just can't quite get to the success three feet from gold. So, you know, it, it, that's why there's so many of them, because mm -hmm. different people need different messages. Yeah. And I meant to ask it before, but, but I want to know. Uh, and I'll, I'll finish it here, but with Think and Grow Rich for Women, why is that for women part important? As opposed to Think and Grow Rich, and we all can use that. Well, the first line of the book says, why a book for women? And I, and I started it that way because most of my career, I resisted writing anything for women because I felt the steps to success were the same for men and women, which I still believe that. But we approach them very differently, our mindsets, our backgrounds. And so the original book, Thinking Grow Rich, was released in 1937 after 25 years in production. There were no women in business. So there are no women re female references in the book. And so I wanted to show the same that the fact that it is the pathway is the same. So I used the same outline. But I looked at each of those steps through, through the eyes of successful women for each of them. So that when you read it, if you're a woman, you can say, oh, I, I don't relate to that person at all. But the next one you say, oh, if she can do it, so can I. So it's empowering. Mm, that's really powerful. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for you sharing. Very welcome. Truly grateful. Thank you. We're honored that you invested time with us today at the Mentor Studio. Now, don't be greedy. Share this knowledge bomb with all your dope peeps on Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Actually, we'll even pay you to do it. To get the deets, please check out the mentorstudio.com.